upon us, and we are glad. Uh, let's use this time during the prelude to uh, put aside the cares and the distractions that we have brought into this place and to turn our hearts to the Lord in expectation to meet with him during this worship service this morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We come today and worship of the Savior of the nations who has come to us in Jesus and who is with us now as our God, our Emmanuel, God with us. This is the third Sunday of Advent and we are grateful for this privilege that we have of worship. And as we uh, gather this morning for worship, I have just a few announcements. I'll highlight a few things that are in the bulletin. Uh, there are announcements in the bulletin uh, four, five, and six about uh, uh, Advent Christmas details like poinsettia information. There's a form in the bulletin, an angel tree form, um, some notes about uh, contributions and offering envelopes. There's also some notes there from the vision team, and I encourage you to read over those and to be praying for the vision team. One of the questions that we've been having that we've been um, using to focus our prayers and discussions is uh, how does God want to express himself through our church in our community at this time? What will that look like? And what will that look like in three to five years? That's what we've been uh, thinking through. And, and we uh, need your prayers as we seek to discern where God is leading us together. 
One additional announcement. I, I'm happy to say that, that New Abbey will be back and worshiping with us this week. Uh, they have been spending a season of worship with another congregation, um, and that has been a blessing in many ways for them. And I'm glad that they are coming back now uh, to worship with us. So they will be, their worship service will be at 11.30 today. So just a reminder, uh, we will have time to fellowship downstairs. And as people from New Abbey are coming in, if you're still here, please greet them warmly and uh, tell them you're glad to see them. I, I know that we are. Um, and let's also remember that they'll, they'll need to be setting up and, and uh, getting things ready for their worship service. So um, after we've said our greetings, we can go on downstairs and continue our fellowship down in Fellowship Hall. But glad to have them back with us. Our call to worship is from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Let us worship God.
You may be seated. And will the children please come down and join me up front? I am so excited to have you here today. This is such fun to be able to light the Advent candles together. And each week we light a candle, and that means we are getting closer and closer to Christmas. There are four Sundays in Advent, and then the next week is Christmas. And each one of these Advent candles reminds us something about Jesus and his coming. So we have, uh, this is the third Sunday of Advent. So how many candles will we light? Three. We will light three candles, that's right. So I'm gonna have three candle lighters help me here. And uh, Quinn, will you help me? Will you start, Let, here, you hold on to the bottom there and we're gonna light this off of here. Got to tip it way up. Excellent. Now, that, light that candle right there. Does anybody remember what that first candle stands for? Um, hope. That is hope. Excellent. Good. Luke, how about you? You ready? You going to help me with this? Okay, grab a hold of this, and we're going to light this second candle. It's, it's, uh, it's way down in there, so I'll kind of help guide it. And then little, tip it up a little more. A little more, a little higher, a little higher. There we go. Perfect. Good job. Now, what does this one stand for? Uh, um, that, that, um, that is love. 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 Yes. Okay, okay. Now, now we've got a third candle because Jesus brings us hope and he loves us. He brings us love. We've got a third one. Abby, you going to help me with this one? Okay, now it's uh, up there. Tip it over this way. And... Beautiful. Okay, you got it. You know how to put it out? Pull that right back down. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Now, this candle stands for joy. This is the third Sunday of Advent, and we come together in the name of Jesus. He is the Word of God incarnate. I've been telling you big words up here at Advent, words like Advent and Emmanuel. Incarnate means in the flesh. He comes in the flesh. Jesus comes, he is God in the flesh, in a body. He came as a, as a human baby, right? As a, but fully God and a, and a, and a human baby. <clears throat> he was in the beginning, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. Who is the Word that we talk about being in the beginning? That's Jesus, that's right. And how long has Jesus existed? Forever, forever. Jesus has been there forever, but he came as a baby a couple thousand years ago. He was always there with God, and then he came as a baby. And why did he come? He came to bring us hope, and to bring us love, and now to bring us joy. What's joy? What's another word for joy, maybe? Yeah. Happiness, right, yeah, that's, that's the closest word I can think of. When are we happy? When we go on a roller coaster. When we go on a roller coaster, that's a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad you are happy about that. I am not happy about roller coasters. Um, okay, yeah, we're happy when, when fun things are happening or, or good things are happening. You know, joy is a special kind of happiness because it's a happiness that's way down deep inside of us. And even when things aren't so fun, or maybe things aren't so good, we can still have this joy because it is something that God puts way down deep inside each one of us. That's the joy that God sends to us in Jesus. So we've done three candles so far, hope and love and joy. And we'll have one more to do next week, which will be the fourth Sunday Advent. Advent. Will you come up and help me next week too? Yeah. That will be so good. Let's pray and thank God for the joy that he gives to us. Let's pray. Dear God, uh, there are lots of things that make us happy. Um, 
whether it's being with friends, whether it's roller coasters, whether it's uh, pretty snowfalls, whatever it is, lots of things make us happy. But we're, Lord, we thank you that you are able to bring a joy to us that's, that's like a happiness that's way down deep inside and doesn't go away. So Lord, would you keep on giving us and filling us with this joy. And thank you for these children. Watch over them and thank you for their help today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. scripture reading for today is from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 through 7. You'll find that in the Pew Bible on page 729. Uh, background for this is uh, this is uh, a prophecy that was written to the Jewish people uh, sometime around 721 BC and it was just before the Assyrians came in and took the tribe of Israel, the northern tribe, and Damascus into captivity and uh, dissipated them or various parts of their kingdom. God's word. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them the light shone. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you. As with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken on the day as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Praise be to God.
A sign shall be given, a virgin will conceive, a human baby bearing undiminished deity. The glory of the nations, a light for all to see, and hope for all who will embrace his warm reality. Emmanuel, our God is with us, and if God is with us, who could stand against us? Our God is be seated. That is worship. That is a glimpse of worship around the throne. What a joy it is for us to come together as God's people to know that God, our Emmanuel, is with us. Um, Singing that certainly brings back many fond memories. It brings goosebumps to the skin, a tear to the eye, and joy to our hearts. I'm 
I'm also grateful for our elders as they help lead in worship. And Mike, thank you for reading. I'm grateful for the elders when they give us a little background um, because we know that prophecy well from Isaiah 9. And it is a prophecy of hope and a prophecy of joy. But boy, that background is poignant, Mike. Thank you for sharing that because Israel was on a roller coaster and they were about to go over the edge. And they were about to be captured, taken into captivity, and to be dominated, to be sent out of the promised land. And how important it was for them, before that dispersion to take place, to hear this promise of hope, to remember that there is a son coming who's gov who would bear the government upon his shoulders and that carried them through those days of exiles, exile. And brothers and sisters, we celebrate Advent. We celebrate his coming, but we also celebrate his promise to come again. And when we feel like we are on that roller coaster and when we are about to go over the edge, we hear that promise that Jesus will come again and the government will be upon his shoulder firmly and finally and forever and that brings joy to us. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John's Gospel, the first chapter. Beth has written this piece that is so helpful to us at Advent, this candle lighting piece that uh, brings us to mind of the first advent as people were waiting and also for us as we wait for the second advent, for the second coming. When is he coming? Who will he be? How will I know him? How will he know me? The light is coming. How will we respond to that light? Well, we're going to see some things about that in these few verses from John chapter 1. We've been working our way through what is sometimes called the prologue to the Gospel of John, which is the first 18 verses of John's Gospel. And we come this morning to verses 9 through 13. So let's pray that God would open our ears to hear Oh, Lord, our God, we come before you. And in one sense, in one way, this seems like a very natural event. We have a calendar for it. We get together on Sunday mornings, the Lord's Day. We sing and we read and we pray. And these are things that we can do naturally. And yet, Lord, you are with us. And because of the presence of Christ, our light, and the power of your Holy Spirit, this need not be just a natural event, but rather you have the power to do something supernatural in our lives at this moment. So Lord, would you be pleased to send the power of your Holy Spirit in this moment that you would take these words from off the play page and plant them deep within your, uh, in our hearts. They are your words, they are powerful words. And Lord, let your spirit go before to open our ears and our hearts to receive them and to respond to these words and to respond to your word incarnate, to respond to Jesus with faith and trust and obedience and joy. We pray this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus the Messiah. Amen. John chapter 1 verses 9 through 13. Hear the word of God. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, 
who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Years ago, we used to see t-shirts from time to time that said, Jesus Christ, the real thing. You remember that one? They, They used the red and white letters in kind of the flowy script, the font that Coca-Cola used because that matched the Coca-Cola logo and, and their motto, which was Coke. It's the real thing. Well, I don't see the shirts around so much anymore. Maybe Coke complained, I don't know. But Jesus, of course, is still around, and he is the real thing. John says he is the true light, the real, genuine, authentic, perfect light, the Messiah sent from God. He is the real thing, the word, the life, the light of men. All other so-called saviors are pretenders and pale imitations. Jesus is the real thing. The true light, the true light of Jesus shows us things. The true light of Jesus shows us God the Father. A few verses, we'll read these verses next week, but a few verses later, John says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, that's Jesus, he has made him known. Jesus makes the Father known to us. Jesus is the light that helps us to see the Father. But the true light also shines on us. The true light of Jesus reveals ourselves, our nature, to ourselves, so that we see ourselves more clearly. So the coming of this light reveals God and reveals us. And his coming is so central and so important to all that happens later throughout history that his coming demands a decision. What shall we make of Jesus? How will we respond to Jesus? Our verses today show us three possible responses to Christ. There's agnosticism, there's rejection, and there is faith. We see them all three in these three verses, and we will take them in turn and see how they probe our own hearts, what they reveal about us. The first response is agnosticism, which means not knowing. It's ignorance. The, the, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Not knowing. The unbelieving world just doesn't get Jesus, or Christians, or Christianity, for that matter, but doesn't get Jesus. And you know, most of us can understand that. Most of us have things that we just don't get. Have you ever gone to see a movie that all your friends have been raving about, and you come out of that movie scratching your head, thinking, ah, was I in the right place? I I don't get why they like that at all. The unbelieving world just doesn't get it, doesn't know the God, even the God who created it. They have lost the ability to perceive spiritual things. They are blind to the true light. 
Why is that so? Well, I think there are several factors. Part of it is our fallen human nature. The Bible says the natural person does not accept the things of God, the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In our nature, naturally, there are certain things that we just can't get because they are spiritual. So it's partly our fall in human nature. It's partly also that we have an adversary. We have Satan who is scheming to keep us away from God. The Bible says the God of this world, that's Satan, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. But there is also a blindness that comes to us because of what we have done to ourselves. In the book of Romans, the the Bible describes how God's power and deity, His divine nature, they are revealed in the world that He has made. And we see it. Everybody sees it. That's, That's what the Bible says. Everybody sees God's nature and His power. But we repress that truth. We push it down, we push it out of our minds, we push it out of sight. For although they knew God, the Bible says, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. So there's this thing that we do to ourselves. We, we, we push the knowledge of God that we have and we see in the world that he has made, we push that aside. And through long habits of pushing aside, our hearts are darkened. And God gives us over. And we are left in the darkness unless God does something else. We don't see because we don't want to see. That's why the world does not know Jesus. People people often say, if God is real, if God is real, why doesn't he just make himself known? Why doesn't he make himself visible? But of course, that's exactly what Christianity claims to be the fact that God came and took on human flesh so that people could see him and touch him and hear from him, see how he reflects the nature and the character of the heavenly father. To see Jesus is to see the father. Our problem is not with God revealing himself, but in our ability and our willingness to see the true light. So one response is agnosticism or not knowing. A second response is rejection. We see Jesus, but we don't want to live by what we see. We don't, we, we don't want him as Messiah sent from God um, who came to claim people for himself. He came to his own, the Bible says, and his own people did not receive him. Well, his own people are the Jews, his fellow Jews, the children of Abraham. God called Abraham out of the unbelieving world. God called Abraham to be the father of a nation, a people belonging to God. And they had God's law, and they had the prophets, and they had God's promises of the Messiah who would come. The government would be upon his shoulder. 
And when he came, his own people did not receive him. What a shocking, shocking rejection. You remember one time Jesus told a parable about an owner who owned a vineyard and he went away and left the vineyard in charge of his tenants. And when the harvest time came, he sent servants to his vineyard to receive some of the grapes and the wine. And the tenants beat up the servants and killed them. So after a time, the owner sent some more servants. And when they got there, the tenants in the vineyard beat them and killed them again. And so finally the owner said, I will send my son. At least they will respect him. But they kill the son in a vain attempt to rule the vineyard themselves. Within days of speaking that parable, Jesus, the Son of God, was delivered over to be killed on the cross. When Governor Pilate asks, shall I kill your king? They shout, we have no king but Caesar. What a tragically blasphemous thing for them to say. It's hard to imagine a rejection worse than that. But let's not just think about their rejection, let's think about our own temptations to reject the one that God has sent. It's dangerous for us to presume, presume that we have a relationship with God. We often hear people say, we are all God's children. It's like a, a creed, a, a primary statement of faith. And it's true in a certain sense because we are all related to God in this way. He is our creator. He created every one of us. We all bear the image of God and have a certain intrinsic dignity because of that image that he has placed within us. So that is true. We are image bearers and we are a creation, God's creations. And yet the Bible says there are some who will become children of God. We are all related to him as creator, but we cannot claim to belong to him if we reject his son Jesus. And Jesus spoke very frankly to those who felt spiritually confident and secure even while they were rejecting him. So he says, for example, later in the Gospel of John, it's recorded, Jesus tells these self-assured religious people that weren't following him, Jesus, Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. That's pretty blunt. So how then can we respond to Jesus in a way that shows that we do belong to God, that we are children of God, not through agnosticism and not, not through rejecting Jesus, of course, but by receiving Jesus and believing in his name. That's the third response that we see here. To receive Jesus is to bow before him, to declare our allegiance to him, to profess our affiliation to him, to submit to his authority and leadership, 
to sign on as his follower, to take an oath, a pledge of loyalty. To receive Jesus is to believe his name. The Bible often talks about the name. Uh, the name being a stand-in for the whole person. To believe in his name, that means to believe everything about Jesus. To trust him as he truly is. We might like the idea of Jesus more than the reality of Jesus because we'd like him to always affirm what we think and want to do. We don't like so much to think about Jesus who would challenge us. But to believe in his name means to receive him as he is, loving and stern, affirming and disciplining merciful and righteous, forgiving and demanding. Well, how can we respond to Jesus in that way? In, it's frankly beyond us. We can't do it on our own. We need help. We need God working in us. We must be born of God. Like in that conversation you may remember that Jesus had with Nicodemus when he said, to this self-assured, highly intellectual, deeply biblically literate uh, teacher of Israel, he said, you must be born again. You must be born from above. Because unless God does this miracle of regeneration, we cannot see the kingdom of God or enter it. It is God's decision to adopt us as his sons and daughters. When we're born as babies, we become a part of a human family. Our, our spiritual birth as believers is a little different. This birth, the Bible says, this birth does not come by blood. In other words, we don't inherit saving faith from our parents. You may have heard the saying, God has no grandchildren. You ever heard that one? God has no grandchildren, only children, only those who themselves trust and believe in him and the son that he has sent. All of his children are adopted individually. They receive and believe Jesus, each one on his own. This birth does not come by blood, and it does not come by the will of the flesh. It's not a result of natural impulses or desires, but rather of supernatural power. God is doing an outright miracle in us. And this birth does not come by the will of man. It is not primarily dependent upon our decision to be adopted by God, but his decision to call us out of darkness and into his light to make us to be a part of his family. And by the will of God and through faith, we become children of God. And here's why all this matters. It reminds us, first of all, to be patient with unbelievers who just don't get Jesus. They've lost the capacity to know God and to recognize Jesus as the one sent from God. And we were in that condition once ourselves until God opened our eyes. But God can open eyes. Let's not be careful also. Let's not be careful to presume that we are closer to God than perhaps we really are. The Jews had many spiritual advantages, but so many of them still did not recognize him when he came. We might assume that we are in good standing as God's children, when in fact, there's still a lot of ways in which we act as if our father is the devil. Thanks be to God for his grace and mercy. Along with that, we remember that Jesus is coming back. And 
if his own people were surprised by his first coming, then we who now are his people through faith in Christ, we too might be surprised at his second coming. So let's stay humble and watchful and ready to receive him. And it's good for us to be thankful too. As God's children, we are born by his will, not our own. There's no room for boasting here about being smarter than others or more moral or more disciplined. God in His grace has adopted us. And that makes us happy. That makes us joyful and humble. And how do we know that God has done this thing? How do we know that God has wrought this miracle in our hearts? It's when we receive Jesus as he is and believe in his name. And lastly, we must profess this faith for ourselves. God has no grandchildren. It's not enough for us to have Christian parents, to have been raised in a Christian home, to be a part of a Christian church, to grow up into a culture that still has some Christian roots and traditions, we can't slip into the kingdom with a false ID. Our faith must be genuine. It must be our own. And Advent gives us an opportunity to renew our allegiance, to re-enlist as a follower of Jesus. Christ comes into the world shining as true light in the darkness. Will we ignore him? Will we reject his authority and claim as to be his own and under his command? Or will we receive him and believe in his name? Let us pray. O Lord our God, the world does not know you. So help us, Lord, patiently and faithfully and hopefully point to the light of Christ. And Lord, spare us from presumption, from assuming that we are closer to you than in fact we are. Prepare us to receive Jesus now by faith and to recognize him when he comes again. And by your will, O oh God, continue to bring spiritual rebirth to lost souls, to give sight to those who are blind. And Lord, how precious it is to be loved and chosen and adopted by you, our Father. You have made us your children. You provide for us. You care for us. And you hear us when we call out to you. So hear us now, O oh Lord, as we lift up our prayers to you. We pray that you would be with those who are in pain or suffering, those who are dealing with illnesses, those who are enduring hardships, those who are recovering from surgeries. Lord, we lift up Barb to you and ask that you would be with her as she goes through cancer treatments. Lord, bring healing and restoration to her and to all who cry out for physical strength and restoration. Lord, we pray for those who are lonely or those who are discouraged or depressed those who are looking for guidance and for open doors. Lord, um, we thank you 
that all of these things, all of our needs do not depend upon our finding our own solutions or mustering our own strength and willpower, but we can turn to you, our mighty God, who makes all things new in Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for your work. Lord, would you put the government of our community and our nation and the world upon your shoulders? Would you reign as Prince of Peace in Ukraine, in China, in Nigeria, in the streets of our own violent cities? Lord, would you reign as Prince of Peace? Be with those who grieve and mourn. Be with our services and the services of all our brothers and sisters as they worship you this Advent and Christmas season. Be with uh, all those who are hearing the word of Christ, perhaps through the first time, through a worship service or Christmas music or a reading or a book. Lord, would you open hearts to respond to you with saving faith. Lord, would you guide our vision team as, as we seek your guidance into our future because we want so much to be a faithful people who are fruitful in the work of your gospel in our community. And Lord, thank you for knowing us so deeply. Thank you for coming as true light. Thank you for shining light upon us that we might see God our Father and so that we might see ourselves. And Lord Jesus, as you see us and as you know us, intercede for us. Carry our prayers to before the Father, even those groans those deep hurts, those needs that we have that we dare not mention even to another soul. Lord, take them and carry them to the Father. And Lord, hear us now as we pray, as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
and cheer our spirits by thine advent here and drive away the shades of night and pierce the clouds and bring us light rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to Go forth now under the grace and the mercy of God our Emmanuel. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. God.